On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PBS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. I'm here with Adam Decker of the Houston Astros organization. Adam, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate your time. Tell the listeners about yourself, if you would, please. Yeah, uh, well, thanks for having me, first off, and thanks for your patience. I should let everyone know how patient you've been with me. I've rescheduled on you about six times, so uh, thank you very much for that, Chris. Um, yeah, so I'm originally from Canada, a place called Winnipeg, which is uh, kind of right in the middle of the country. Um, grew up playing you know tons of hockey not being a canadian that's kind of what you're born into so played a lot of hockey but played a little bit of everything always loved sports it was kind of always what me and my friends loved to do and talk about and it was always a big part of my life and, um so yeah i did that and then where i needed to figure out what i wanted to do with my life uh you know being a professional athlete probably wasn't in the cards so um you know i was kind of leaning toward psychiatry actually is what i was kind of first pursuing and then, um, you know, I just realized it wasn't, this ultimately wasn't for me. And I really needed to take a, a step back and think about what I actually want to do for the next kind of 40, 50 years of my life. And, you know, it just kept coming back to sports. And so I went and, and kind of jumped into the exercise science field and kind of been doing that ever since. So, um, but yeah, I started out, um, you know, with the Canadian Olympic group, uh, kind of the first jobs I had and then kind of worked my way through um, Sergio Soleil and the National Hockey League and now Major League Baseball. So a little bit of everything. Uh, I want to get into your role with Houston soon, but first I want to kind of kick off with those other roles, actually. So I want to talk about uh, the, the positions in the NHL, the position with Cirque, the position with the Canadian national uh, teams, like kind of walk me through your journey. And then along the way, I'm just going to fire questions at you because I'm just genuinely curious about, you know, all those stops before this. Yeah, yeah, quite right. I, um, so first thing was I, so as I was saying, I did my bachelor's degree in exercise science and really kind of realized that yeah this is what i want to do i really like it uh you know but being in winnipeg honestly there wasn't a ton of opportunities for education beyond like a bachelor's degree i was looking to do maybe a master's in exercise physiology or something but there just really wasn't any kind of practical opportunities for that uh and not a lot of like professional job output uh, outlook excuse me um, so kind of wanted to figure out what I want to do there. So, uh, ended up doing a, uh, a degree in education actually, after I finished my exercise science degree and, uh, which has actually been very useful. Not that I was, <laughs> I did do a little bit of teaching and not that I was the world's greatest teacher or anything, but, um, it did teach me a lot about communication and working with different types of people and, um, you know, kind of figuring out what makes them tick. So I think it was actually probably the most useful degree I've got actually is probably my education one. Um, and then following that, I did uh, do my master's degree uh, in Pennsylvania in uh, exercise physiology. And then, uh, so anyway, upon moving back uh, to Winnipeg um, after that master's degree, there was a job with uh, Sport Canada, and they were looking for somebody uh, in the Manitoba branch, Sport Manitoba, uh, to basically create and run uh a high performance training center for like provincial level athletes or state level, I guess you'd call it in the US, state level athletes. And they didn't have anything like that before and they wanted to develop it. And so I applied and really didn't think I had any chance of getting it. Um, and was very fortunate to have, I, prior to that, I was uh, volunteering with the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, which is a uh, unaffiliated uh, baseball team, uh, like American Association, I think they're called now. Um, and loved that. So I had a little bit of experience doing that. And certainly through my schooling, I had, experience but you know this was a job that was probably way over my head if i'm being honest and um you know after you know round after round of interviews i somehow convinced them that i could do the job and i got it and uh, so they hired me on as i think the title was like sport performance manager if i'm remembering off the top of my head and um anyway yeah so they they kind of trusted me to take this old kitchen and cafeteria space in this warehouse building um and turn it into a high performance training center for provincial level athletes with the goal of uh, trying to produce more Olympians from Manitoba. That was really the mandate. And uh, yeah, so I got to, you know, they gave me a budget. I got to pick every piece of equipment. I got to staff it, create every policy, you name it. And I was basically the head strength coach, head sports scientist, the rehab guy, the 
I mean, you name it, I was doing it. It was, it was pretty amazing actually. The, you know, they, they just trusted me to do so much stuff and they let me make mistakes. And it was just a brilliant opportunity for me, honestly, just to kind of try a little bit of everything. And I was lucky to work with some really smart people. So yeah, I got to do that. And then uh, from there, I got promoted up to a senior management, uh, senior manager of athlete development. And um, for there, I was basically running the high performance strategy for the province, essentially. So kind of working with each NSO, PSO, or excuse me, national sport organization, provincial sport organization, working with coaches and high performance directors and uh, like multidisciplinary teams, kind of put together long term plans for athletes and teams. And again, trying to guide them to like that Olympic pathway and um, yeah, I did that, had some success. We eventually expanded that initial training center that we developed into like a $28 million facility and um, set a bunch of records at the Canada Games uh, for most gold medals and most uh, improved province two years in a row and most total medals. So I had just a bunch of success. And again, not probably not a lot to do with me, probably more to do with the other people around me. I was very, uh, very lucky to work with. And, um, and then from there, I got uh, promoted up to the Canadian Sports Centre, which was the kind of Olympic branch the national team focus branch of sport Canada. And uh, so they hired me on as the uh, head of performance science and talent identification. And so it was able to do a bunch of different stuff, but working a lot with like individual Olympic athletes and um, some teams. Um, and yeah, just, I mean, through that experience, I, I got to work with so many different sports and athletes and coaches and just, it was such an immense learning environment. I, so I was with them for all set, I think about eight years, um, and it was just an incredible experience. And then, uh, yeah, and then so as I was doing that at the Canadian Sports Centre, uh, I started to do my PhD. And um, and through that, that's how I got hooked up with Cirque du Soleil. So my um, PhD advisor and I, we were presenting at some conference in Banff, where you're about to go. And uh, there was a guy in the audience who was kind of really keen on what we were saying and kind of kept inching closer and closer to the stage. And um Right after we finished speaking, he approached us and said, hey, would you guys ever want to come work for Cirque du Soleil? And I had said, well, you know, I've got this job at the Olympics. I'm really enjoying it. You know, I'm, I'm pretty content where I am, but I started my PhD. Would you would be willing to take me on as a, like a researcher? I can do all my research with you. And, and they very graciously said yes. And so that's how I got hooked up with them. And so all of my PhD research was done um, with Cirque du Soleil. So I was kind of constantly traveling uh, you know, across Canada for my other job, but a lot of the time in Montreal to do data collection and, and stuff like that with the Cirque artists. And, um, and eventually that led to me getting a job offer from them, which is why I left the Canadian Olympic team. Yeah, and then from there, uh, you know, I was with Cirque du Soleil, uh, did that for a couple of years. I was uh, running their performance science department, a lot of stuff on the rehab side as well. And then unfortunately COVID hit and uh, kind of shut Cirque down for like a, pretty much a full year actually. And, uh, you know, a couple months into that, I was getting a little stir crazy and uh, I'd done my PhD. So my son had like just been born. He was a COVID baby. And, um, you know, was really getting kind of antsy about something to do. And this job opportunity came up with the New Jersey Devils uh, to run their uh, performance science uh, group and uh, so I, and kind of rehab strength conditioning. And so jumped at that, uh, moved to New Jersey, and and off we went. And uh, so did that for, uh, again, a couple of years. And um, a friend of mine, actually a colleague of mine with the Devils, used to work with the Astros and had told me about this job uh, of the director of sports medicine performance with the Astros when it came up. And uh, he said, hey, I think you'd be good at this. Why don't you kind of give it a shot? And I kind of kept putting it off, honestly. Like, I didn't, I, I was thought it was a great job, but, you know, I liked what I was doing. And, um, but the job I noticed was kind of the posting kind of was staying up and I was like, well, this is kind of interesting. Maybe I just haven't found anybody. So I said, you know what, I'll, I'll throw my name in there and see what happens. And, uh, you know, I was very lucky. I, I did this kind of one way video interview and that seemed to go well. And I got a call from Pete Putilla, who at the time was the assistant general manager from the Astros and is now the general manager of the San Francisco Giants. And he and I hit it off just immediately, like really, I think just had a great rapport. He's a wonderful guy. And, uh, you know, that kind of snowballed into an interview and away we went. And so I got the job uh, and I've been in Houston ever since. So that now it's my third season with the Astros. Um, do you have a favorite athlete or group of athletes that you've worked with? You said you had a bunch of different sports at the uh, the Olympic Center and then obviously being with Cirque and the NHL and now baseball. Like it's a totally 
like all over the place resume, which is really cool. Um, being at Exos now, like we have athletes from all over. I, I had, we had like a bull riding team in one day and I just never yeah. thought that we'd do strength and conditioning with bull riding. So for me, it's been really cool to just see other, you know, sports and athletes and things like that and kind of how to work with them. Um, do you have one in particular that kind of stands out or does each one present like its own challenges and rewards? Yeah, it's hard to pick a favorite. I, I think you kind of nailed it. I mean, I've worked with so many different people and cultures and just in different environments. I, like, there's kind of funny stories and great experiences at each stop, I think. Uh, I mean, the Cirque du Soleil artists were just so unique in so many ways. I mean, just some of the stuff that they – and it was so different than anything I'd ever seen before. Like, I tell this story all the time, but it kind of perfectly summarizes my experience with Cirque du Soleil. The first day I was ever there – I, I walked into this training room and there was a guy, uh, you know, he's like six two, absolutely shredded, you know, just in great shape. And he's sitting there doing a full on split, uh, eating his lunch very casually. And he's talking to his friend and his friend happened to be balancing on his head, on this guy's head with one hand, uh, also doing a full split, like a full one headed handstand on this dude's head. And they were just having like casual conversation, eating lunch, like this was nothing. And I had just never seen anything like it before. So that the circus leg group just stands out because they were just so incredibly unique in what they do. But you know, the the people everywhere I've gone have been great. I've had so many funny stories and just so many great experiences. And um, you know, the one thing I will say is I've been I think that's probably the best thing about my career is that I've had these different experiences. Cause I think without a doubt, it's made me a much better practitioner, people manager, whatever, whatever. And every realm of my job, I think I'm better because of the diverse experiences that I've had. Yeah, that's kind of how I felt. And I've been at Exos now for six months. And like I was in baseball for almost a decade and it was just all baseball all the time. And then I get here and basically the only group that I haven't worked with is baseball because I got here at the end of their off season. So it's been, you know, NFL and semi-private clientele. And we had an Aussie rules football team in, and we had, like I said, the bull riding and it's just kind of like, oh, okay, there's training that can be done for anybody. And also there's like these unique challenges that, you know, when the bull riders come in, all of them have one huge arm from just wrestling this bull and the other arm's probably broken because they've landed on it. So how do we work with that? So uh, I, I can totally relate to what you're saying. And then specifically, you said that you were doing your PhD research with CERC. Like what was that looking like? And then you know, maybe the training they're doing and then kind of the sports science that you're looking at with them, like ultimately what were you researching with them? If you can go into it. Yeah, no, happy to. We, uh, it's going to take me back. I'm going to try to remember everything we did. We, um, you know, we did a very, it was a, a diverse group of projects. So my PhD advisor who, uh, his name is Dr. Dean Fielars and he's one of the most brilliant, just one of the most interesting and brilliant people I've ever met in my life. So if you ever looking for someone to speak to i to everyone listening i highly recommend you reach out to dr dean freelars in winnipeg he's uh phenomenal in so many ways but anyway um he really wanted to kind of push me to do things in a multidisciplinary way so we did all sorts of different studies we did one on uh one on sleep so we did a big sleep study um and looked at like the qu quantity quality of the performer sleep we did another one on uh, that was definitely more on the psychology side of things. We looked at like what are the daily challenges in the lives of circ performers, and uh, you know try to create uh, then like coping resources and and different types of external and internal resources for them to uh, kind of work through some of the challenges they were facing. Uh, what else did we do? We did a lot of we did like uh, wearable technology, so we would look at. Um, at the time, we were using a company called WeMu. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but it's very much like a catapult unit, right? So we were trying to quantify like acceleration changes and, and kind of map what that would look like and look at things like what changed between uh, performance one and performance two, because certain performers perform like 400 shows a year. I don't think most people know that. And they often do like two performances in a day. And so we would look at, we would literally just do like a basic time motion analysis and look at all the acceleration data and say like what changed did they land differently here or did they have more acceleration here so that kind of stuff we did i mean it was a i'm kind of it's been so long now i can't even remember the number of stuff we did but we did uh just a lot of like different studies and kind of different domains it was, it was really interesting and again just a great learning experience for me and then in terms of the nhl you said you were doing mostly rehab with the devils 
Well, so uh, sports science, uh, it was kind of two things, sports science, and then they, I was also the strength conditioning rehab person. So if a player was hurt and wasn't going to travel with the team, basically I would I would stay and uh, kind of write those rehab programs and work with them. And then, uh, but I was running the day-to-day -day performance science. So, um, you know, you know, putting catapult units in players' uh, shoulder pads, doing all the testing, uh, writing all the data reports, all that kind of stuff. So very, very much like traditional day-to-day -day sports science stuff. Did they ever have you out on the ice too or no? Uh, sometimes. Uh, mostly it was to like collect data, but, uh, you know, once they saw my hockey skills, they they didn't want too much more of that. <laughs> but but uh, no, once in a while, I mean, it certainly gives an appreciation for just how good they are. Because, you know, I grew up in Canada. I was, you know, all kidding aside, I was a pretty decent hockey player. And I mean, these guys are just exponentially better than what I ever was. So it's definitely, uh, it's an ego check for sure. And then in terms of like your day-to-day -day life and schedule, uh, like how did those differ between Cirque and the NHL and then now uh, your role in Houston? Yeah, I mean, every again, every stop has been different. It, like even with the, like the Olympic team, you're kind of – depends which sport you're working with because every sport's got different training schedules. But, um, you know, hockey was the most – definitely the most grueling day to day, uh, you know, like you get home. From a trip potentially, and you'd be home at like three in the morning at eight, you know, so sometimes you're sleeping at the rink and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, that was pretty grueling. Um, you know, but then you do get a nice off season. So that was good. Uh, my job now with the Astros is, um, less player facing and more kind of staff facing, um, you know, front office type work. So, um, you know, it's a little bit more traditional. Like I, you know, kind of start my day. I mean, I'm, I was, I kind of say it this way. Like I'm accountable, you know, 18 hours a day basically. Uh, but I a lot more flexibility of like when I actually get to the office and when I leave the office, I kind of work, I'm working all the time, but you know, it's a little bit more fluid that way. So a little bit more work-life balance for sure. in in my current position. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then you mentioned that you have great stories along the way. And I guess this would be a two part. Like, what is your best professional baseball story? And then what is your best story outside of professional baseball? Huh. Best story. Uh, well, the, I'll tell you the two, uh, I mean, two incredible experiences. Um, you know, obviously I've been with the Astros now for my third season. So, uh, you know, when we won the World Series, that was obviously pretty fantastic. And, and that year uh, we were in uh, the ALCS, we were playing the Yankees. And so... Just prior to coming on to the Houston Astros, I was living in New Jersey. So my, you know, my family, we would go to Yankees games pretty often. So by the time we made it to the ALCS, that year I had, I think, been to more Yankees games than I had been to uh, Astros games in Houston, oddly enough, because I was, when I first got hired, I was based in Florida. And uh, anyway, very generously, they invited me to go to uh, Yankees. And so I brought my family with me. And, uh, you know, we were watching the game in the GM suite. Yankee Stadium, you know, we, sw we swept the Yankees. It was just, I mean, that was one of the most incredible experiences ever. And then we got to go, you know, after the fourth game, we got to go on the field and, and celebrate, you know, we're going to the World Series. I mean, that was just, that will always stick with me just because, of, you know, it was where I used to live. And it was, there's just so many memories from that, which was just incredible. And then, you know, very related to that was, um, we got, I got invited to go with the team to the White House and and do that whole visit and tour and, uh, you know, visit with the president and everything. I mean, it was just, you know, I just never would have dreamed that in a million years. It was, uh, it was incredible. And so those, those would be the two that from baseball, I mean, there's been lots, but those would be the two that I think will stick with me for a really long time. Um, outside of, you know, outside of it, there's, there's things that pop into my mind all the time. But they're all sort of different. Like I remember, like there's funny stories where, you know, like at the end of one of our New Jersey devil seasons, uh, our coach was Lindy Roth and really, really funny guy. I, and we did this like boat cruise around uh, the Hudson and we got to see like right up to the Statue of Liberty and all these cool things. And, you know, we're passing by the Statue of Liberty and, uh, you know, I say, hey, Lindy, would you or I'm, I'm kind of taking pictures and Lindy, Lindy Roth asks, he's like, hey, hey, Dax, would you want do you want a picture? And I said, oh, sure, that'd be great. And so I go and I'm you know, kind of standing next to the Statue of Liberty expecting him to take a picture and I come back. And I look at my camera and the only thing he's taking a picture of is my ass. And I'm like, oh, thanks very much, Lindy. So, you know, just kind of stupid things like that. But then, you know, with the Olympics, uh, you know, one that sticks out was I was working with this Olympic wrestler who had had 
just a really she had been kind of horribly abused by a former Olympic coach and just her, her career you know had really she was one of the best in the world I mean had her training partner not been the Olympic and world champion she probably would be right there like she was she was amazing but just happened to be partnered with essentially Michael Jordan and so just you know didn't quite get there but um anyway she had just had a kind of a horrible experience and was pretty much ready to quit and um you know I think she kind of wanted to do one last ditch run and she got uh kind of hooked up with me and uh you know I think just through I I don't know we just kind of clicked and got her back to kind of loving the sport again and got her back to competing and got her back to the Olympic trials and it was like a two-year process and I think um you know, I think the most rewarding part about that was just seeing her growth as a person from somebody who had been, you know, through a really traumatic, horrible experience to, uh, you know, to a really healthy, happy person again, most importantly, and then also was competing at an extremely elite level. And um, that was, you know, stuff like that really sticks out. And there's there's been many kind of stories like that. But uh, those kind of personal stories are the ones that I think stick with me more than anything else. Yeah, it's always either the personal stories or the ones that make you laugh, right? And uh I grew up in the Buffalo area. So like seeing Lindy Ruff coach the Sabres for a while and like just some of the antics that you could kind of see even in games. I was like, you can only imagine what he does like behind the scenes. So uh, it sounds like he's a cool guy. Sounds like he's fun to be around. Very typical hockey guy. So um, what do you believe in within strength and conditioning that others think you're crazy for believing? Other people think I'm crazy for. I don't, you know, I don't know if people would think I'm crazy for it. I think two things that maybe I value more than other people. Um, so I mentioned Dr. Dean Krelars, who was, you know, my biggest professional influence by far. Uh, he comes from a real like neuroscience background and is really big on like movement and not, not like technique so much, but more just uh, change of direction, agility, you know, um, like kind of brain training is what he calls it. And so I really value that. I don't think that's something that we do enough. I think we focus a little bit too much on like linear speed and kind of fixed agility drills, but I think there's a lot more to it than that. And so I'm big on like movement repertoire, movement creativity. Uh, you know, we use a term in Canada. I don't know if you use it, but physical literacy, uh, you know, diverse movement. So that, that's something that I definitely value. And I, even in sports that you wouldn't traditionally think that that matters, like hockey, for example, where you know, it's on ice, there's gliding, you're not really like doing hard cuts or anything. Um, I, I, you, I've firsthand seen how impactful that can be from like an injury prevention and performance standpoint. So that's something I really value. And I think as I've moved into away from the day to day, like weight room, sports science, rehab kind of environments, um, I think more and more, I, I understand the value of like systems and how, how important alignment is from not only within a multidisciplinary team, you know, your strength team, your nutrition, mental health, medical, like all those groups, but how aligned that needs to be with player development, how aligned that needs to be with uh, your management team. Really, everybody just needs to be rolling in the same direction under like a shared vision and mission and, and culture ultimately. And um, those are things that I just value immensely. So more than the tactical stuff, I've kind of gone the other way with it. Is when I first started, I would very much recruit people based on like hard technical skills. Uh, I almost have gone the entirely the opposite direction. I almost don't give a shit, honestly, too much about, excuse my language, about uh, people's technical skills. Um, you know, I think they, they need to have some sort of experience, of course, but uh, more and more I, I buy into the people. And, you know, I always feel like it's partly my job and others to to train technical skills. And I think those are much easier to train. I think if somebody's, you know, going to be kind of the problem child all the time, that's kind of hard to weed out. So I'd rather just bring in the right person and we can, we can deal with the other stuff later. All right, everybody, that's going to conclude part one of this two-part interview with Adam. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, I enjoy all of my conversations. I especially enjoy the opportunity to speak to a coach who has either been in baseball and left or has had a bunch of experiences leading up to getting into baseball. I think for me, it just provides a unique opportunity to have a conversation with somebody who may see things from a different lens uh, or maybe just a little bit out of the box. Uh, and obviously, Adam, having worked in Sport Canada, working with Cirque du Soleil, and working with the New Jersey Devils in the NHL, he has a wide array of experiences and a lot of good stories to tell, a lot of good experiences to have learned from that he's bringing to Houston in professional baseball. Three things that I took from Adam in this episode, 
Diversifying your experiences will provide unique challenges that can ultimately make you a better practitioner. Having a vast movement repertoire can help your athletes with injury prevention. And there are times where being a good person is as or more important as being a good coach. So again, thank you for checking this one out. Uh, and with that being said, we'll talk to you again on the next one. <music>